Shalom, everybody. It is Wednesday afternoon, April 10th. We are picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 37. We're reviewing starting with verse 9. We're really in verse 10, but we're going back to Yosef's dream. But just before we do, toward the end of our last class, we were asked about Yeshua, Jesus' robe. It's been described as a purple robe by most Bible translations. Sometimes it's said to be a red robe, but I think purple is a little more accurate from the original language. But it was asked, was that an expensive garment? That's the idea that many have taught. And if so, how do we have that conclusion that Yeshua lived a life um, poor, that he didn't have you know, expenses, expensive materials and things? So I did a little research on it. We also knew that they did not part his robe. That, uh, and that's where the idea was given that it was too valuable to part it and so, and so on and so forth. When you get into the original language, the garment that Yeshua Jesus wore, the ones that, that his executioners were gambling for, um, it, apparently it seems that the executioners, the ones who actually did the nailing of the victim to the crosses, they were allowed to take for their pay, they may have gotten pay also, it might have been a bonus, I don't know, but whatever possessions were taken off of that victim would be divided among those who were the actual executioners. So it's not unusual that they were taking his, his garments. There were five pieces, there were four executioners, we're told. This comes out of historians, it does not come out of the scripture other than it does say that they gambled for his garment. Um, it's believed that the others, that each one got an individual garment, then they had this one piece left, and the better word for it would be a tunic or an undergarment. It makes us immediately think of the high priest and the undergarment that would be worn. It was a woven piece of material, that's why it wasn't able to be torn. There weren't seams to tear it apart, and they certainly weren't sitting there with scissors ready to cut it. So it was one piece, it would have the opening for the neck, it would slide over the neck, and then it would just go down over the body, and it could have been full length, it could have gone all the way to the feet. But you do have to realize, um, being worn by him in the beginning, whenever they finally took that off of him. The robe that they put on him that was purple was something that they had mocking him as a king. And they did that to most of the prisoners that they crucified. That wasn't <clears throat> totally unusual. There were games that they would play with those prisoners. Often, the prisoner didn't even make it to the cross before they were dead, just from the torture of the games and all that they had gone through. But any who made it all the way to the cross were crucified. So they had a robe. They made the crown out of thorns, you know, we know all of that, so it, the robe was not his that they put on him, and the <clears throat> garment that they took of his is this tunic, this undergarment, this woven uh, without a seam piece that reminds us of what the high priest wore. It would have been comparable, I'm going to say, to what our Orthodox Jewish people wear today that you don't see. It's worn like an undershirt. It goes, their shirt goes over. If they're ultra-Orthodox, you do see the seat, see the fringes hanging out. You'll see, you know, their, the pants, the shirt's tucked in, but you see these fringes that are hanging out. That's comparable, that's today's style of what this would have been. Uh, it does not mean that it was expensive, it does not mean that it was um, a value, and that's where I derailed myself with what he had gone through before he ever got to the cross, it wouldn't have been a, a, a nice piece of material, even if it had been uh, of, of great cost, because by now it would be bloodied and, and you know, it would be pretty disgusting. I imagine any value that was given to it would have depended on that person that was being crucified, just like you see with people who want souvenirs off of a rock star or a sports person. You look what happened when Kobe Bryant uh, passed away and people were, you know, trying to make money off of his whatever. It, I imagine it would have been like that. Sometimes it could have been more valuable because people wanted it, you know, but it wasn't because it was something nice. So that's the best I can do, um, adding into what we read in the scripture from <coughs> our historians at that time. So, yes, sir. Uh, one thing I did read about was 
when they were talking about the Roman soldiers that were there, they all had tunics they wore. And they were of different colors, but their color reference back then compared to what we had now, a little bit colors are different off. And they talked about like the purples and the blues and stuff. They couldn't afford to give every soldier. So they, they were more of a red variety, but they were washed out red. That's what they were saying. Okay, that's for the Romans though. Right. But so that's that's probably where Jesus got his his robe he got from. They took oh, off one the, of the soldiers. The and purple put it on him. robe that they oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, could be. Just mocking him as a king. Could yeah. be, could be. They just use yeah, that no. makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the input. Welcome. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, then I think that answers our question at the end of class. Well, so now we'll be in Genesis 37, and we'll pick up reading in verse 9. So we have that, and remember we're talking about Joseph. Joseph, we're talking about his life is a picture foreshadowing of Messiah. We see, we've seen it in, uh, by the time we start verse 9, we've seen it in 10 different ways. We're going to see 37, I think it is, 37 ways in this chapter alone and over 80 ways in his life. I think it's 86. All of a sudden, I don't know if I'm dyslexic with my numbers or not, but whatever I said before, stick with it. <laughs> so uh, in verse 9, when it says that he had a, still another dream, we've already talked about the one dream. His brothers weren't too happy with that dream because they were bowing down to him in that dream. Now he has another one related it to his brothers and said, Lo, or behold, I have still another dream. Behold, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. So the first one was the sheaves from the field. That was earthly obeisance, the earth bowing down to him, uh, people on the earth, so to speak. Now we're seeing the heavenly, uh, uh, what do we call them, bodies bowing down. So it's speaking of a heavenly dominion which we know that belongs to the Lord and the Lord alone. We know that Satan right now is called the prince of the power of the air. He's allowed to work in that realm right now. We know that's who we, we war against in the spirit. But over him is Yeshua, who is the creator of all, all things made for him, and he, he is the one in control. We will see the fulfillment of heaven and earth, everything <coughs> worshiping, Messiah, Savior, in the future time when Revelation 20 has been uh, brought to pass with the end of Armageddon, Yeshua coming down from heaven, stopping that battle, setting up his kingdom and the whole world worshiping him. And of course it goes on into eternity also. But, uh, uh, but here we just have the, the picture of Yeshua being over the church, the church, the called out assembly, they're a heavenly people. We're called that because our citizenship is in heaven. So the way we call ourselves an American because we live in America, even though we are not living this moment in heaven, that's our home. We're just ambassadors on duty for him right now and should be serving him in that capacity. What does an ambassador do? Represents the home country to wherever he is. Represents the king of his country to wherever he is. Um, look with me real quick at Matthew 28:18. I'm not sure if we did it last time, so we'll do it this time to make sure we get it. Matthew 28 and verse 18. And in that we read, And Yeshua and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He had the authority even when he was walking in his human flesh, in his God ship because he was fully God and fully man, all authority was his. God had given it to him. And he being equal with God, they had that authority together. So we just see the preeminence of the Lord even in that verse. Now going back into, um, well before you go back to Genesis, let me take you, because we've read it, let me take you to Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is what we looked up last week, but here's where our review will end and we'll start getting into new material. In Revelation 12, we see similar language to what we've read about in Genesis 37. We have that there's a great sign that appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, on her head a crown of 12 stars. In uh, Bereshit, you had the 11 stars bowing down to the 12th, bowing down to Yosef. So we have similar language here. We're seeing 12 stars, 12 tribes, Yosef being one of the 12 tribes of uh, Israel. 
we know we're talking similar language. As we go down in chapter 12 in Revelation, it's very clear who it's referring to when it says that this woman it, it clothed with the sun, the moon, and the, the stars, the, the crown of 12 stars, she was with child, that's verse 2. And that child that she brings forth, we're told in verse 5, is a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Well, who's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron? We know that's Messiah. We know that's Yeshua Jesus. Who's the woman that gave birth to the, to the child? Remember, the son wasn't born. The son was given. Who gave birth to the child? Israel. Israel brought forth the one, the Messiah, in the Jewish line. As we see even now why it's so important that Yosef's line is <coughs> spiritually right. That's why God chooses him and his descendants for the Messiah to come from. We saw Cain knocked out. We saw Ishmael knocked out. We saw Esau knocked out. These were not the spiritual line. God kept that line all the way through. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, eventually David, and out of David's descendants comes Messiah in his human flesh. So it is Messiah who will rule. It's in the future when he rules all the nations with the rod of iron. He's referred to it this way in Psalm 2, a messianic psalm. It speaks of Messiah very clearly and doing homage to him, honoring him, bowing down to him, lest he be angry with you. But notice in verse 5 of Revelation 12, he's, he's the one who's to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But we also read, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now that's where Messiah is now. He's caught up into heaven, his ascension, 50 days, 40 days, sorry, 40 days after he arose from the dead. And we know that he's at the right hand of the Father. We saw that in Revelation 1. We see it in Revelation 5, especially 5, um, more specifically. So we know that there's a time gap in here. That we haven't seen him rule all the nations with the rod of iron on earth, but we know that he is up in heaven, that that's where he is. And then verse 6 tells us what's happening during the tribulation time. The woman, Israel, fleeing into the wilderness to the place God prepared for her. There she would be nourished, and it comes out, the, it gives you in days, but it's the three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. Why does Israel flee into hiding at the midpoint of the tribulation? Because that's when the abomination of desolation has happened. An abomination is idol, idolatry, idol worship. The Antichrist at this point has gone into the temple where sacrifices have been going on because the third temple has been built, it has been reestablished. And at this time, the Antichrist sits on the, the throne in the, uh, well, he sits in the, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and declares he's God and declares, worship me, bow down to me, or you have your head cut off. And that's going to cause them to, to flee from the temple. That's why it says it makes it desolate, the abomination of desolation. And that's where Matthew 24, verse 15, tells Israel, the ones who are paying attention, who are hearing God, listening to his word, he tells them, when you see that happen, then flee. Get out as fast as you can. Pray it's not in the end of winter when it's snowing and it's hard to travel. Pray it's not on the Shabbat, Sabbath, when there's not as many ways to get out, cars and buses and, you know, the bus lines are down. Everything's shut off for Shabbat. Pray that you're not a woman nursing a child because, believe me, we know what that's like right now in our family. She doesn't move fast if she's in the midst of nursing. She needs to sit and nurse. So all of these are telling us the urgency. Get out, get out, get out fast. Why? Because the Antichrist is going to cut off allowing anyone to flee. He's going to stop them, and if they don't bow down and worship him, they're going to lose their lives. Any chance they have of surviving this time, they need to get out. They're going to go to a place that God has prepared for them. That's the place in the wilderness. In summary, for any who don't know, we believe that very likely is a place called Petra. There's reasons for that. See my studies in the book of Revelation. Talk to me later, whatever you need to do to get that if you want more information on that. But that puts it in the perspective we realize this is Messiah. This is what's been foretold. This correlates with what Daniel says, with what Zechariah says, with what Hezekiel says. Many of our prophets speak to it. This is how we put it together. We use scripture to understand scripture. So we know when we're looking at this, we're looking at a picture of Israel, we're looking at a picture of Messiah, 
we're looking at the fact that there will be the time all will bow down to the Messiah. So the sun, the moon, the stars are representing the family of Israel, I'll say, and it's speaking of Yeshua Jesus coming to the nation of Israel. But let's go back to it now in Genesis and see how the brothers take this dream. If they didn't like the first bowing down, they're not going to like a second one that's reaffirming and, and telling them a bit more. But still, when he had the dream, he saw the sun, moon, and stars bowing down in verse 10, 9, then verse 10. He related it to his father and his brothers. He told them what he saw in his dream. And his father even rebuked him. His father was, was a bit taken aback by this. And he says to him, what is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? You know, in his mind, he's thinking, and this is Jacob. Remember, Jacob's the father of, of Yosef. And he, he's thinking, you know, it's one thing to say that your brothers are going to bow down to you. But now, me, the, the patriarch of the family, the, your father, your mother, the ones who gave you life, we're going to bow down to you. This is what he's he's questioning. So obviously they're perceiving, or at least Jacob is, that this could be a prophetic dream. This is something that, you know, it was just, oh, ha, ha, what you eat last night? They blow it off. It wouldn't matter. But Yaakov's smart enough to know there can be prophecy. This can be a foretelling. This can be a message from God. And we do know that God gave many prophetic messages of coming of Messiah. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 are very familiar to you. The child that would be born, the son that would be given, the names that are given tell us that he is God, a wonderful counselor, uh, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. I could go through all of those, but see another lesson on those names because that would take me an hour and a half to do those, and then I still wouldn't even do it justice in an hour and a half. So, uh, But again, it spoke to his coming, as a child, as a son. And verse 7, it talks about the dominion that's on his shoulders, the government that's on his shoulders that would be forever. In fact, let me take you to verse 7 on my way to Luke because we're going to um, go to Luke in just a moment. But everybody's familiar with Isaiah 9, 6. Not as many are familiar with verse 7. So I quickly gave you 6. Then 7 says there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the, th oops, sorry, yeah, on the throne of David, David, and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it, how? With justice, with righteousness, from then on and forevermore. Wow, did, did you catch what that's saying? A government that's ruling righteously and justly. I'll ask you, number one, have you ever seen a government rule rightly and justly and everybody's got to say, no, you know, there's corruption that always has come into the earthly governments. This is one that will not because it's this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this eternal or everlasting father, this prince of peace who is, who is the head of this government. That's why, because he is righteous. He is Sar Shalom, the prince of peace. He is able to bring that. He will sit on the earthly throne of David, David, and over his kingdom. All the other nations will come to be blessed, and this will be established from that point on forever. When Messiah comes and rules on David's throne for a thousand years, a millennial time, Satan's let loose for a little time after that to take all who want to follow him out with him. They're going to come up in the face of God to dethrone God or dethrone Yeshua the Messiah. They're going to find out they, they don't even make it to home base. They don't make it to first base, whatever I should say. They don't even get up to bat. That's what I'm trying to say. Before Satan's going to find himself cast in like a fire for a, forever, and all of that is destroyed, and we go on into eternity future, a time of the Lord ruling forever and ever and ever in that kind of peace, that kind of justice. I say hallelujah. We're aching to see that kind of world. That's what God wanted for us from the beginning. And finally, this world will see and know it. And how is it accomplished? It tells you at the end of that verse, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. His enthusiasm for it, his energy for it, this is going to carry it out into being fact. And wow, what a prophecy. Now, with all of that in mind, let's go to Luke 1. Because remember, we're talking about Yosef's life uh, foreshadowing or... or um, 
paralleling our Messiah. And this is how we see there were prophetic announcements about his coming birth. There were prophetic announcements about the ruling and reigning. So in prophecy of Yeshua, having that future exaltation, seeing him in that kingly role, that's how Yosef seeing himself in a kingly role. He's seeing others bow down and do homage to him. This is the way his life is paralleling what will happen to Messiah. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, we read, And behold, don't miss it, pay attention, behold, you will conceive. Uh, this is the angel speaking to Mary, to Mary, the mother of Yeshua. <coughs> you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Yeshua. He will be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. That's the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will rule, rule over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Does that not sound like what we've just been studying? What we see in Joseph, the foreshadowing of his rulership, and what we read about in Revelation that we'll see come true in the future. So there's the future exaltation of Yeshua that he would be uh, placed in the womb as a son. He, that's by virtue we know the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. If you can't believe that, then your God is too small. If he can create the world out of nothing, how can he not put himself into the seed in, in the woman's womb? We know it is miraculous. It's a sign that, that would be not that a young woman would conceive. There's nothing miraculous about a young woman getting pregnant, but a virgin is the sign. She would conceive. It would be miraculous. It would be this one, and he will, in, in time, rule and reign over the entire creation that he has made. Uh, let me take you also to Matthew on the way back to Genesis. Just stop short at Matthew, a couple books before Luke. Go to Matthew 26. And verse 64, Matthew, Matthew, he was a good Jewish boy writing to a Jewish audience. And verse 64, Yeshua, Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter, after these things, hereafter you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And I give you again, remember Revelation 5. Where is he sitting? At the right hand of the Father. He's sitting on high. He's a power. Right hand is the, it signifies power. So he's right there now with the right hand of power. And in Revelation 20, that's mine and it's supposed to be on silent. <laughs> Sorry, folks. That's my alarm to pray for the release of the hostages that goes off every day. It's a new phone. I thought I put everything on silent. Obviously, I've got another <laughs> step to learn, so forgive me. Hopefully, there's nothing else that will go off. Uh, but anyway, the, the coming on the clouds of heaven is described in Revelation 19. When he comes back in the clouds, we with him, because we've been caught up, we've been with him, we're clothed in our robes of righteousness, we've received our rewards, in other words, and we come back to rule and to reign with him. So, very clear picture, very prophetic, of the time that Yeshua will be exalted, when he will be reigning King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we say, Hallelujah, forever and ever. Can't wait. <laughs> so, uh, Yosef's life is parallel, paralleling prophetically the future that Messiah will hold also. Notice back in Bereshit, in Genesis, when the, the declaration is made. Uh, okay, I'm trying to get back to my Bible. There we go. By Yaakov, by Jacob, shall I and your mother? Remember, Rachel is, is his mother, and she has passed away. So who is he meaning? Is he meaning, are you seeing something about her raised? It could be, or it could be that Bilcha, Rachel, Rachel's right hand, uh, who also gave children to Jacob, that maybe she stepped in and continued on like a real mother to him. It could be Leah even took on that role because, you know, the girls were sisters. It was her sister that died. If my sister had died when I had, when she had young children, 
I would be very quick to mother them, to bring those children in as my own. So it could be referring to any of them. It does not mean Rachel. It does not mean Rachel, literally, unless he's looking at it totally prophetically. Okay, so I think we're ready for verse 11. His, how did his brothers take it? They were jealous. You said it, Dor. They were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in his mind. Okay, and the brothers were jealous. Go with me to Acts 7 and verse 9. What are we going to read there? Acts 7 and verse 9. Acts chapter 7, verse 9. And there we read, The patriarchs became jealous of Yosef and sold him into Egypt. So in, in those who are our fathers in our, in our history line, they were jealous of Joseph. They sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him. Okay, it makes it very clear. The brothers were jealous. Now read with me Matthew 27. I should have told you to keep uh, a finger in there. Uh, go with me to, to, maybe it was longer ago. Matthew 27, and we're going to look at verses 17 and 18. Matthew 27, 17, and 18, and here we read, So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas, the murderer, or Yeshua, Jesus, who is called Christ, who is called Messiah? For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. What's envy? Jealousy. They handed Yeshua Jesus to Pilate to try to get Pilate to condemn him to death because they were jealous of him. They were jealous of the fact that, and this is the leaders, that they saw the crowds turning to him, following Yeshua Jesus, and they feared there was going to be an insurrection. Rome would come down on them harder. This one was raising up and getting a group of following. What's going to happen to them? They're losing their people. So they were jealous of him. They were envious of him. One reason why they wanted him put to death. And here we see the relation. Jealous or envious of Joseph. Jealous or envious of Yeshua Jesus. Uh, but the, his brothers didn't influence the people. The people themselves were jealous. I mean, not the people, but the, the Pharisees. Leaders, the Pharisees. The ones that started. Right, right, yes. So it isn't an exact, you're right, but it's still the same idea. The, the people, the Pharisees were called his brethren, Joseph's oh, okay. brethren, oh, yeah, okay. because they were, they were Jewish blood, you know. We'll, we'll say today, that's my kinfolk, that's my kinsmen, you know, so in that sense, that's how it's meaning it. Okay, uh, and Yos, uh, Jacob, in verse 11, back in Genesis 37, Yaakov kept it in mind. He observed it. He preserved it. He paid attention to it. He might not have liked it because we do hear kind of a rebuke here, but uh, he's, he's pondering it. He's thinking about it. He's got to begin to be realizing there's something different with this son. You know, does he fully understand? I'm sure not. You know, we have to remember we know the end of the story from the beginning. We have had it put together. We've had a chance to study you know, before, but they're just living it out in real time. So, but even though he rebukes him, I think he had have wondered, is this a word from God? Is this prophecy? Is this something prophetic? You know, what's God saying to us here? So, Joseph's had two dreams now. Life goes on, you know, we've had a couple of nights, a couple of dreams, but life's going on. So, we read in verse 12. Then his brothers, Joseph, Joseph's brothers, went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Okay, uh, again, pasturing, you know, tending to the flock, tending to their needs. Shechem, some sources will tell you 80 miles or better, but really I'm going to say it's more like 50 plus miles from Hebron, from Hebron, from the area where they are. At least 50 miles separate, okay? But Shechem is very interesting. What's the last thing we remember happening in Shechem? <laughs> Bless you. It wasn't a sneeze. Abraham stopped, wasn't it? It was with Jacob. Oh, with Jacob. That's where he went the first time when he came home. Right. That's where Jacob stopped when he came home. I love it. <laughs> came back to Israel, came home. 
and he settled in there for a while. Remember he said to Esau, you know, we've got little ones, it's too much to push them on, we've got mamas that are nursing, it was good pasture land, they kind of settled and got comfortable there. What helped them to get up and go on all the way down to the Beersheba, Hebron area where Jacob had promised to return? And God held him to his promise and brought him there. But do you remember what caused him to leave Shechem and come down to Beersheba? When the boys killed all the men in town. Good for Dora. She gets an A+. Plus. <laughs> it's chapter 34 for any who don't remember. This is when uh, Dina, Dinah, the one daughter, had been raped. The boys of her brothers that defended her honor killed off all the men in Shechem. Got them to be um, circumcised. And on that third day when they could hardly move took advantage and killed them and Jacob said you know now we got to get out of here because we don't know how the other people are going to take this and even the other cities around who might come to the defense of the families that have now been destroyed in this manner so they left Shechem and they came down to Beersheba and remember Yosef was about maybe six years old at that point he's 17 now so we've got a 10 11 year you know, time in between. So apparently things must have quieted down enough in Shechem that, that they could go back into that area for pasturing. You know, remember it is the land of Israel. It is what God promised to his people. And Jacob still owned property there, I'm sure. He had built an altar there. He had done other, you know, there. We read about this in chapter 31, chapter, actually 31, 33, and 34. You can read different things that happened in Shechem, you know, with Jacob. So it's not a surprise that they're going there. If this was three months later from when the incident happened, I'd be surprised. But 10 years later, owning property, having this as the landmark, knowing it's good pasturing, not really a surprise. But what it does is it takes his brethren away from the father. Jacob didn't go up to Shechem. Jacob stayed down in Hebron, Beersheba area. The sons went up, okay? So the brothers are away from their father. And God's chosen people, Yeshua's brethren, okay, but I'm going to just say it this way to help you understand. God's chosen were away from him, away from the Father, when Yeshua comes the first time. They weren't in right relationship. They weren't living right. If they had been, they would have recognized him as Messiah. They would have wanted him as Messiah. It would have been a whole different picture. But we have that he came into his own, his own received him not. That's it recorded for us in Yohanan and John, I think it's chapter 1. See, the 1 and 14, sorry. I think it's when, it's in John. If you want the reference later, ask me, I'll find it. My mind's spinning right now. But the point being, again, we've got the brethren away from the Father when Yeshua came the first time. We're going to see what goes on while the brethren are away from the Father with Yosef. And let's read what happens to find out. So Israel, Jacob, but remember Jacob's name was changed to Israel and is often used that way when he's spiritually right before the Lord. Uh, Israel said to Yosef, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, I'll send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Okay, so Jacob's going to send Joseph to go check on the brothers. Jesus, Yeshua, is sent by the father to check on his brothers. Here's our uh, number 14. Our number 13 was that they were um, jealous of Joseph. They were jealous of uh, Jesus, you know, or envied. The 14th comparison between Joseph's life and Yeshua Jesus' life is that they're both sent by the Father when the brethren were away from him. So the brethren are away from Jacob, and Joseph's going to go check on them. The brethren have moved away from a relationship with God, and God's going to send Yeshua, who is going to do more than just check on them. Um, to see that the Father sent him is my point. Go with me to Yochanan to John chapter 5 and verse 24. John 5 and verse 24. Yochanan, John 5, 24, we read... Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 
does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. This is Yeshua Jesus speaking. Who else can say that if you hear his words, believe in him who sent me, believe in God the Father who sent God the Son, then you have eternal life, and you're not going to come into judgment by God. You're going to pass from death into life. It doesn't mean that physically they won't ever die. They're not around today. We don't see any, what, 4,000-year-old men walking around here today by the, the names of the brethren. But it does mean that spiritually they will not see death. They will go into an eternal life with God the Father and God the Son. We see this also in verse 36. Go down in the same chapter, John 5, verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. This is Yeshua Jesus speaking again. My testimony, my witness is greater than John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, they testify about me. And what do they testify? That the Father has sent me. Remember Nicodemus, Nectamon said, you know, we know you came from God. You can't do these kind of miracles if you haven't come from God. They could see it. We're told by those who do not want to believe in Yeshua Jesus, oh, he never claimed to be God. Well, hello, what's he saying right here? He's telling them very clearly that the Father sent him, and he's going to say, I and the Father are one. He declares that he's God. He declares that he came from heaven. He declares that he came from eternity past. He declares he is equal to God the Father. And it was so clear that the Pharisees wanted to pick up stones and stone him for blasphemy. Blasphemy was declaring himself to be equal with God. They got it. Yes, he declared he, who he was. So here we also have very clearly the type that tells us that Yeshua was sent by the Father to do the work of the Father. Joseph's going to be sent by his Father to do the work of the Father. He's going to go check on the brethren. There's a little more to it than checking on them. But notice how Joseph responded. I already gave it to you back there in Genesis. He said, I will go. He said, here am I. He said, Hineni, for any of you who know that word, immediate obedience. He didn't say, um, well, let's wait and see if they come back next week. Or, I'm really tired, let me get a couple good nights sleep, let me pack up some supplies. He didn't give any excuse. He didn't do anything that would delay. He basically rose to the occasion and said, I'm here, I'll go. And that's Yeshua. He was willing to come into this world. We read that in Hebrews 10 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7 where we read in Hebrews 10 7 then I said behold I have come in the scroll of the book it is written to me I've come to do your will O God Yeshua declared that I've come to do the will of the Father as soon as the Father said go I came I came to do his will I came to carry out his will so in the same way that Yeshua was willing, we see Yosef was willing. And they both were willing when the brethren were away from the Father. They weren't waiting to say, oh, let, let's, let's find a good time. Let's come when we know they're in a good place and everything would be good. Even though Yosef knew his, his brothers envied him, and that envy is fine line between envy and hate. They're starting to hate him. He knew that, and he was still willing to go check on them. Yeshua knew what was going to happen to him when he came to his own. He knew they were going to reject him. He knew they were not going to throw open their arms and welcome him in and say, you're our Messiah, you're our Savior. No, they weren't about to at all. So both were willing to come to a world knowing they would not be received well. I'll put it that way. That's our, our next point. Sent by the Father and willing to come, both of them. Points 14 and 15. Back in Bereshit, chapter 37, and verse 14, when Yosef told his father Jacob that he was willing to go, then in verse 14, Jacob said to him, Go now, see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So they're both going to seek out the welfare of their brothers. That's the type uh, that we see again of Yeshua Jesus that he came to seek their welfare, not his own. 
He didn't come and set himself up comfortably. He didn't put himself in a palace. He didn't put himself in a place of worship. He came lowly. He came humble. He came unknown to most. He came riding low on a donkey. He did not come for himself. He came for the welfare of his brethren. Yosef is going to go to check on the welfare of his brethren. Look with me to see it for Yeshua and John again. Yochanan, John chapter 1. And verses 11 and 12, Yochanan 1, verses 11 and 12, makes it very clear. It says, he came to his own, and those who were, who were his own did not receive him. There's the verse I wanted a few minutes ago, John 1, 11. I don't remember where I told you it was, but there it is. He came to his own, his own did not receive him. But to as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So Yeshua came not to condemn, but he came to check on the welfare, and any who would receive him, he welcomed them in. And we'll see that Yosef, his intent was not to condemn his brothers, but to check and see, are you okay? Is there anything you need? Look at Matthew, hold on, let's do John since we're here. Let's do John 3, 16 and 17. You're very familiar with 3, 16. I'm sure you can quote it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. But notice verse 17 in our context of what we're saying. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That was his intent. He knew they hated him. He knew they were going to be envious of him. But he came to save them. He did not come to condemn them. That's the love that, that God the Father and God the Son have for the world, really. But we're seeing it in relation to the Jewish people at this time. Matthew 15 and verse 24, we read there, But he answered and said, this is Yeshua Jesus speaking, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, this is when a Gentile woman's coming to him and wanting healing, and he's saying to her, why are you asking me? I'm here for Israel. And she very sweetly and diligently, that's the wrong word, but I mean, she wouldn't give up. She said, well, you know, even the, the dogs, even the puppies, even, you know, the, the, the ones that aren't the actual children, they get the bread crumbs from the table. Just throw me a crumb, Lord, I'll be satisfied, was her intent. She knew that that would, would bring her healing. And you should... Uh, ah, what's the word I want? He praised her for her faith. Okay, there's a word I can't get right now. But anyway, again, he didn't come to condemn, even though she wasn't Jewish, she didn't even condemn her. He, he gave her the, the miracle of healing that she was asking for. And Yeshua never came to condemn. He came to save. And Yosef, we're going to see, came to help, not to condemn them also. Now, why is Jacob sending Yosef? We have to understand he did not see that the enmity of the, of the brothers was so great. He would not be sending his son into harm's way if he knew that. And he's concerned about his other sons. And apparently it's been a little while. He, the, he's not heard word. They've not come back. He wants to make sure that they are okay. So he's concerned Maybe even thinking, I know what happened up in Shechem before. I want to make sure nothing bad has fallen on my, my sons. You know, somebody needs to just go check on them and make sure that the surrounding attitude of the people hasn't gotten volatile, that there isn't any problem. So that's why he wants to send someone to check on his sons. Remember, they couldn't pick up a cell phone. <laughs> they didn't have a way of knowing. They had to, somebody had to physically go. And um, Joseph was ready, willing, and waiting to go. So back in verse, I think we're in 14 still. Um, go now and see the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So go find out and come tell me how they are. So he, Jacob, sent him, Yosef, from the valley of Hebron, Hebron, remember he's in the Hebron, Beersheba area, and he came to Shechem. Okay? Now the valley, you may have the veil of Hebron. Veil of the valley is, is speaking the same thing, but in our Hebrew, that speaks of rest, 
it speaks of peacefulness, it's a place of communion. A good word that we would use today would be alliance, that this is a like people who are aligning together to help each other. That's the meaning of the name Hebron or Hebron mm -hmm. uh, as it looks in your English. I'm sorry that the city of this day is a hotbed of, of uh, violence. It's not peaceful. It's not an alliance. Um, it's Arab run right now and many of the hostile Arabs are in that area. We have an Israeli that has a canteen for the soldiers in that area that was shot two years ago and it miraculously survived, thank God. But it's a hot area. It's a place many don't even go see that area because anything can happen at any moment. But the name originally did mean an alliance, a place of communion, a place of peace. Yeshua Jesus left heaven the place of peace the place of fellowship. He left where he had communion with the Father and was willing to come to a world that was not that way. So in this way, Yosef leaves that place of peace and fellowship and communion with his Father and goes on a trip, so to speak. Yeshua Jesus did the same, point number 17. We see in Yochanan and John 6 and verse 41, Yes, ma'am? Question? Question? Oh, now where, where are you going? John 6 okay. and verse 41. Okay, John. Yes. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. I... Again, they're getting the idea. That's not mine this time. <laughs> And Roger's trying to leave, so we'll, we'll forgive him. <laughs> Try to kill my alarm. <laughs> well, don't kill it, but stop it. <laughs> okay, I think you can hear me over it. I'm just going to go on. So Yeshua, the Jewish people were grumbling against him because they caught that he said he came from heaven. He had come from the Father to them. Yosef came from the Father to them. Okay, look at chapter 17 and verse 5. Look, John 6, John, still a book of John, sorry, chapter 17 and verse 5. Now, Yeshua is praying, and he's praying to the Father in heaven. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. That is so clear that he is saying, I was with God the Father before this world ever began. I am God. I am from eternity. I mean, it declares it all the way. There's just absolutely no way you can miss that Yeshua is declaring he and God are equal. He and the Father are one. So he had that communion with the Father. It reminds me of verse 1, chapter 1 of Yochanan of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And we know that that was before anything was created because everything that was created, you're not taking care of her? <laughs> everything that was created, sorry folks, um, was created by Yeshua. He existed before he created it. Obviously, you can't create something if you're not alive. And only God can create, and only Yeshua, equal to God. So they left this place, a communion of alliance, of peace, of fellowship, and he came to Shechem. Shechem is a place of strife and a place of bloodshed. We saw that in chapter 34. And that, again, Yeshua came to a world of strife, envy, hatred. He came to a world that was going to be willing to shed his blood. So, again, we see Yosef's life portraying uh, what's going to happen with Yeshua. So, very interesting how the comparison goes. Back in chapter 37 and in verse 15, we have that um, Joseph's on his way now to Shechem. It says, a man found him. Behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? It was obvious. Joseph's now in the fields in Shechem. Mm -hmm. He's not seeing his brothers, and he's looking around for them. So it, it's obvious, you know, what is going on. Um, when we read wandering in the field. Remember how we use scripture to help us understand scripture? 
when we go over to Matthew chapter 13, in an analogy that the Lord is giving and he explains it, we find out what the field means. So go with me to Matthew 13, because sometimes it's symbolic language that's being used. In Genesis, Joseph is literally in the field wandering around. In Matthew, in the parable that Yeshua is speaking, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 38, where he gives the explanation of this parable, he says in that verse, the field is the world. Sorry. Um, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, the tares are the sons of the evil one. So in that parable, the field is representing the world. There's going to be those saved, there's going to be those who are working for Satan, for Satan, in that world. Yeshua Jesus, leaving that place of alliance and peace and communion, coming into a world where there is strife and bloodshed is going to happen, he wandered in that world. The same way Yosef's wandering around, where do I go, where, where are they? Well, Yeshua wandered because he said there was no place for him to lay his head. That's Matthew 8 and verse 20. Matthew, just go back a few chapters to chapter 8 and verse 20, and this is number 19 in our comparisons. Matthew 8 and verse 20, Yeshua, Jesus speaking, said, said to him, to um, the Talmudim that were, the, it was a scribe in particular who had come to speak to him, he said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He didn't have a place that belonged to him, and this was his own. The others had their home base, but he did not. He wandered in the field. Yosef's trying to find a clue as to where his brethren have gone, what might have happened to them. Yeshua knows where his brethren have gone, but he's in a field in a world that's not welcoming him. It's not his home. His home is heaven, same as ours in the future is. So back in Genesis 37, and we go back to verse 16, I think. Yes, in 15, the man asks him what you're looking for. And he, Joseph, says in verse 16, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they're pasturing the flock. Well, that speaks of Yeshua Jesus. I think I read it earlier or something similar. Let me read for you real quickly in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Luke 19 and verse 10. Yeshua's own words, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Earlier I told you he, he came to the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he's coming seeking. He's coming to see who he can find that he can save among the lost. So Yosef's looking for his brethren. Where did they go? Yeshua looks for his brethren. Where are they? Those who he seeks those that they might be saved. Okay, back in verse 16 in Genesis 37, we have Yosef asking where they are, tell me where they are, pasturing, where they're tending the flock, where they're feeding the flock. And verse 17, we have our answer. The man said, they've moved from here. I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So he probably was a, a local person, a Bedouin that was living in that area. He probably had um, schmoozed a little bit with the brothers and they've moved their flocks on, they've gone to the area called Dothan. And I just realized I've got the map for you, but Roger's gone, gone now, so I'm not going to be able to put the map up. I'll try to explain best as I can um, where it is. It would be about maybe another 10 to 15, 11 to 15 miles from where um, Yosef was. It would be, if you went just direct by the road from Jerusalem, it would be 60 miles further north. But it was the area known for excellent pasturage. It's the area of Samaria. It's the area had a northern, um, northern Israel. It's the same place where El, uh, Elisha, El, Elisha, El, Elisha, I can't get my Hebrew out, Elisha, Elisha, those are tongue twisters from Hebrew to English. Anyway, the one who, when they were outnumbered, his servant saw all the enemy around, and he was in a panic, this is it, we're going to die. And Elisha prayed, let his eyes be open, that he would see, and he saw the whole host of heaven that was fighting for him. That's in 2 Kings 6, verses 13 to 17. That's the same area. That's Dothan. 
That's this northern Israel, Shechem area, you know, 10 miles from Shechem, 15 miles from there, in good pasturage area. Dothan is said to represent the law or custom, and that's why it's very interesting because when we look at our comparisons, um, I don't know if I remember to say number 20 was looking for his brethren. Yeshua Jesus came looking for the brethren, looking for those who, who would be saved. Now the 21st way, with Dothan representing law or custom, that the, the brethren are just dwelling, doing according to the laws, according to the custom. Yeshua Jesus found his brethren that way. They were under the bondage of law. They were slaves to a religious formalism. They weren't, they were caught up in the customs. Remember the Pharisees fought with Yeshua. You know, how do you let your, your, your Talmudim pick the corn on the Shabbat? And Yeshua said, man was not made for Shabbat. Shabbat was made for man. You know, he, he said, don't you, if it's Sabbath and your donkey's falling in a ditch, you're going to pull your donkey out. You're not going to wait. You're going to take care of that one in need. He was trying to show them you're caught by the letter of the law. Not what God intended. You made, you know, this mountain out of this molehill. You're caught in religious formality, but it's all about relationship. It wasn't about that religious formality. But as the brethren moved to the place known for law or known for custom, Yeshua finds his people in stuck in law and in custom. And so in this way we have a comparison also. Let me read to you, just to back up what I said, Mark. Mark chapter 6, sorry, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, and we'll start with verse 6. Mark 7 and verse 6, we have, He said to them, Rightly did Yeshua, Isaiah, prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain they do worship me teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So he's saying, even when they're worshiping me, it's not their heart that's worshiping me. They're just, it's lip service. That's all they're giving to me. They are not doing it out of a heart of worship. That Their worship is vain. And they're teaching what should be doctrine as law of man. This is the law. This is the way you do it. That's why I can see fast forward in the 1990s. I can be in Israel and see a pipe broken open and the water pouring out and the Orthodox men standing around it. They won't raise a wrench to stop the water flow because it's Sabbath. They, they would rather not have their, their Sabbath destroyed by doing work even though it was a loss of a precious commodity. That wasn't what Yeshua was intending when he gave them the Sabbath. It was to cease from their work so that they would spend time with their focus on Creator God. But it wasn't meaning you can't do something like that. They strain at the letter of the law again. Um, Dothan is also translated as meaning two cisterns or two wells. And it's interesting that in this area today is a well and it's named Joseph's Well. So just an interesting side note there. But again, it's the northern area, the pasture, pasture area near Shechem, a little further north, good pasturing there. So Joseph knows he's made the trek 50 plus miles, he's got to go another 10 miles. <laughs> and I say that because, sorry, excuse me, because Back in verse 18, we're going to see when they, the brothers, when they saw him from a distance before he came closer to them. So he's still far off and they can see him coming. And they realize, all right, look who's coming. It's our little brother, the one who says we're going to bow down to him. And remember, they're jealous of him. They envy him. They do not have a kind word to say for him at all. I think it was last week's lesson when they were so disturbed they couldn't even say shalom to him. They couldn't even wish him peace on his uh, coming and going. They just were, were that upset by him. <clears throat> so they see him in a distance. And before he even came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. Wow. Well, here's number 22, because Yeshua, his own brethren, also plotted against him to put him to death. Matthew, 
Take you back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. Oh, I guess I'm, no, I'm not in it. There we go. Okay, Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 14. Matthew 12 and verse 14. But the Pharisees, Pershing, went out. They conspired against Yeshua as to how they might destroy him. So here's where he had told them about the Sabbath being made for the man, not man made for the Sabbath. And, uh, and they're so upset with him because he's coming against them and their letter of the law, they're saying, we're righteous, you do it our way. And Yeshua is telling him, you're missing the whole spirit of the law. You're missing what, what's meant by it. And so they didn't like that and they start plotting against him. They want to destroy him. Just like the brothers of Joseph. Not we just want to get rid of him. We want to get him out of our hair. No, they have to take it to the nth degree. They want to destroy him. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, as the plot thickened and we moved forward through this time, we read in verses 3 and 4 that the chief priests, the Kohanim, and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest, the court of the Kohen Haggadah, by the one named Caiaphas, Caiaphas. They plotted together to seize Yeshua Jesus by stealth and kill him. So here's the head of the Sanhedrin. Here's here's the well the high priest here, the court of the high priest, and they're deciding, they're getting together talking how they can kill Yeshua. Not just get him out of their hair, but kill him. Do I want to read further? Have I read enough? I'll read verse 4. They plotted together to seize Yeshua by stealth and to kill him. Maybe I had read that. Okay, so I, I get my point across anyway. The brothers, far from home, far from their father's control, the, the paternal restraint would have been there. Jacob would not have allowed his sons to come against Joseph. But far from the father, they're going to act in a capacity that shows how far their heart is from their father. And we can even say that today, that when we're not in that close relationship and that fellowship with the Father, it's amazing what we can do, even as believers, what we can do. That is not right, that the Father would not be pleased with, but we find a way to justify it. How much more the, those who have never known the Father will you know, be capable. And honestly, we can even be capable of murder. It has happened. Uh, so the parallel is there. They conspired against Yeshua to kill him. They're conspiring against Joseph to kill him. Had they succeeded, the line that Messiah is to come through would have been stopped there. So who's behind this? So Tom. Okay, verse 19. They said to one another, the, the brothers, they're seeing Joseph coming, and they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now believe me, they didn't say it nicely. It's like, oh, here's the master of the dreams. Here comes this one. And they didn't believe his words. They weren't pondering them like Jacob was. This dreamer, the way it's implied, is that he's good for nothing else. He's got his head in the clouds all the time, is the thought. You know, he thinks he's better than us. He thinks he's regal. Well, we're going to show him. Okay, so they called him a dreamer that this exaltation, they see it as a dream. You know, he's the master of it. But this was true of Yeshua. Yeshua is the one to be exalted. He is the one that um, we will see that, that exaltation come. So calling Yosef out for his dream, but recognizing what his dream said, is a picture of Yeshua. Yeshua is going to rule. The people aren't going to just, oh yeah, we want him as our king. No, they're going to fight him and try to kill him. So it's true of Yeshua Jesus also, and that's number 23. That uh, the way that it's said is against him, but it's the truth of him. Let me read to you John 10. Yochanan chapter 10 and verse 33. John 10 and verse 33. And here we read, the Jews answered Yeshua, For a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man made yourself out to be God. You, like Joseph, you're being called out for a you dreamer that you think you're going to be a prince and rule. You, Yeshua, we're calling you out because 
because you have equated yourself with God. You've made yourself equal with God. Um, and that's just not allowed. That's nobody, no man can do that. So they're calling them out for the dream that is prophetic, that is truth. Yosef is going to rule over them. They are going to bow down to him. Yeshua is going to be the ultimate ruler. And they are the whole world. Everything will bow down to him in time. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. And Matthew 27 verse 40 is where we will start. And they're saying, okay, um, this is... This is when he's on the cross, but they're going to throw his own words at him as if you were a dreamer. Here's, here's where your dream got you. They're saying here, you, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also with the scribes and the elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others, and he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he delights in him, because he said, I am the son of God. So they both call out the person for what they said they were, that future ruler, the one sent from God, and with Yeshua, the one equal to God. Um, let me read you also Matthew 26. Um, this was when he was on the cross, Matthew 26, they're, they're building up toward that. Matthew 26 and verse 64, I'm going to read you 64 to 66. Yeshua said to him, you have said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. We already spoke to this and that that's Revelation 19, that that's when we'll see that happen. But Yeshua is saying, you've even said it, that this, you know, this is what is going to happen. And the high priest, hearing it, tore his robes, verse 65, and said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have witnesses? Behold, you've heard the blasphemy. And verse 66, what do you think? They answered, he deserves death. That's what they would do with a blasphemous person if they had control of the land. If they were free to bring about the, cat, the death sentence, they would have stoned him right then and there. But because Rome is ruling over them, only Rome can sentence someone to death. So they're going to have to turn to Rome to get him sentenced to death, but they're saying, he, the, you've heard him himself. He's declaring to be God. He's declaring to be uh, exalted, sitting on the throne with God. He, what more do you need to hear? We need to put him to death. Yeah, but they're calling out the truth. They're calling out that dream. They're coming against it, them for their words. They're going to come against Joseph because, in essence, they're going to say, you said we're going to bow down to you, oh yeah? Well, we're going to show you how we're going to bow down to you, and they're going to try to kill him here. Um, but God has a better plan, and he brings good out of it. So, they see him, they plot against him to kill him. Um, the brothers sought to destroy him. Yeshua's brothers also sought to destroy him. Um, I should have read those verses for you because this is number 24, so I'm going to go back real quick. Oh, maybe I did. Did I read Matthew 27, um, 22? I'm not sure I did. I read in chapter 27. I think I got myself confused here. Sorry. Um, no, I didn't read it. In chapter 27, I read to you um, the, the building up toward wanting to crucify him. I read to you when he was on the cross, now in between those two times, when he was before Pilate. Pilate's finding him innocent. Pilate's not wanting to do anything. And he finally says to him, what do you want me to do with, with Yeshua, who's called the Messiah? And they answered, crucify him. Okay, they had no problem saying it. They wanted him put to death. Even let a murderer go so that this one is put to death instead. And go with me to Yochanan, to John chapter 19. John 19. And uh, verses 6 and 15. John 19, 6, we read, So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! 
Pilate said to him, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Verse 15, as we read as the story goes on, So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Whoa. They're denying the king of the Jews. They're denying Yeshua, Jesus. And when they're claiming that, that uh, Caesar's their king, they're, they didn't like Rome being ruler over them. They fought that all the time. They bristled to that and looked for Messiah to release them from that. And yet here they're willing to say, oh, he's, he's our king. He's the one that we do homage to. He's the one that, that we you know, will line up behind. Amazing how far they could come. So both wanted to destroy Joseph and Jesus. That's number 24. So what do they do with Joseph? Because they want to kill him. They want to get rid of him. They see him coming. They're making this plot. And I need to get to where it is in my Bible. My Bible's moving. Here we go. Okay. They put him in the pit. Thank you. That's exactly what they did. Um, here comes this dreamer. Uh, so verse 20. Now then, come, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we'll say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let's see what becomes of his dreams. Okay, so the pit would have been dug by um, the Bedouins, by the Arabs, by the shepherds. It would have been like a cistern place to gather rainwater. You know, it would have been dug for a purpose, but it was still there. Those pits could be 10 feet deep. That's, you know, longer than a man. Um, I'll tell you more about that pit in a bit. But what we're going to see here is a picture of the chosen people wandering far from their father's house. They went looking for greener pasture. They didn't find it. The cisterns that they're trying to get, what the needed water that they would need, are dry. They're empty. They're broken. We saw this with the prophet Yermin, Jeremiah, in chapter 2, and verse 13, other places also, but to just give you an example, how these were used. This is nothing out of um, the ordinary. It was used this way in Joseph's day. It's used this way in Jeremiah's day. And further on, um, we see in Jeremiah 2 and verse 13, when they didn't like Jeremiah, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves, to dig out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So the Jewish people in Jeremiah's day were being called out for turning their back against Jehovah, the God their father, against Yeshua, Jesus in essence, because God and the Father are one. But they turned their back on the one who is the fountain of living waters. That's Yeshua. Yeshua brings the living waters to any who will come to him for salvation. And they said, instead of all this free-flowing fountain of living water that we could drink all we wanted and be satiated all the day long, all the night too, instead of that, we're going to go dig our own sister. We're going to find our own source of water. We're going to find a place to store and keep and have our own water. But the, what do they dig? They dig broken cisterns. They didn't dig anything that could hold water. They didn't do themselves any favor. And that's our chosen people wandering far from the Father's house, they're in an area of dry, of emptiness, of brokenness. And the pit is a picture of that. So um, it's not a new picture for the comparison of the two, but just building on our picture that they're wanting to kill him, they're wanting to throw him in that pit. And that's what they would use these pits for. Um, often they could have a little bit of water in the bottom, just enough to make it very muddy, and the, the person dropped in would get stuck in that mud, not be able to climb their way out. It was just a repulsive and disgusting uh, place. Pit. Pit says it. So that's what they want to do. They want to throw him in the pit, and they'll say a wild beast devoured him, and and that'll be the end of him, and we'll see what becomes of his dreams. So how can he, how can we bow down to him when he's dead? Okay, so that's their intent. Verse 21, but Reuben, remember Reuben's the firstborn, Reuben. He heard this, and since he heard it, it sounds like he wasn't there being a part of it, but he comes along and he hears it. Maybe he'd been taking care of the sheep or something. Um, and so he heard this, and he rescued him out of their hands. 
So Yosef has now come to his brothers. Remember, they saw him coming. They're making that plot. He keeps coming because he doesn't know he's going into harm's way. And yet when they've got a hold of him and probably starting to treat him very roughly, they're going to throw him into that pit. That's when Reuben has stepped in now. He rescues him out of the hands and said, let's not take his life. Okay, wait a minute guys, let's think about it, let's not do it that way. He's, he's jumping in. And furthermore, Reuben said to them in verse 22, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit that's in the wilderness, but don't lay hands on him. That, and here's his reason why he's saying it. He's thinking he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So apparently, he hears the plot, he realizes they want to kill him. He's saying, no, 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 don't kill him. Just throw him in the pit, but don't kill him. And he's thinking to himself, as soon as I get a chance, I'll get the kid out of the pit, I'll get him back to his father. So he had good intentions. He was not like the, the rest of them. That, that's what is happening here as we read it. Um, let's see, what else do I have to tell you? Okay, throw him into the pit that's in this wilderness. Wilderness is used for a desert area. It does not mean it was lush. Remember, you know, they were looking for areas where they could tend the flock. But the cistern being dry and broken, this was a desert place. And again, he wanted to rescue him. Um, so one of the brethren is, is wanting to spare him and to return him to his father. I think the closest we can get in comparison to that with the life of Yeshua would be Peter, Kepha. Remember when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane? Let's take you there. Let's go to Matthew 26. He had good intentions. He didn't uh, carry it out the best, but he had good intentions. Uh, Matthew 26, Matthew um, verses 51 and 52. Behold, don't miss it. One of those who was with Yeshua Jesus, he reached out and, well, I should tell you, this is in the garden. This is when they've come to arrest Yeshua. A whole battalion of soldiers have come to take Yeshua Jesus by force. They're going to seize him. And behold, one of those who was with Yeshua Jesus reached out, drew out his sword, and he struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his head ear. Okay? Kepha went to Yeshua's defense. What I wonder, and we'll have to ask Kepha when we get home to heaven, were you aiming for the ear? I have a feeling you were wanting to cut off the head, and I think maybe the soldier moved and your sword just got the ear. That's all I got. But look what Yeshua does. Yeshua said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. So Yeshua was willing to go with them. We know he's willing to lay down his life for his friends, for, for his kinsmen, for the world, we know. But uh, um, here, Kepha, in his zealousness, cuts off the ear, the, the slave of the, the high priest, he cuts off the ear of Malchus, we're told, I think in Mark is where he's named. Um, and if any of you don't know the story, Yeshua took that ear that had been cut off it was on the ground. He picked it up and he put it back on the man's head and the ear was attached. That's an amazing miracle. That should have made a believer out of everybody who was there watching that happen. How could someone do that? Pick up an ear, put it back on, and it was as if it had been cut off. Wow, what a miracle. But not to get sidetracked, what we're seeing is Kepha came to his defense. One came to his defense. In Yochanan, John chapter 18 and verse 10, we have, But Yeshua, where this said, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed for me. So here's a woman that poured her perfume out. It was um, anointing him in a picture of what was coming as Beth, burial and death. Um, let's try death and burial. Anyway, um, but I still think Peter's the better comparison, but this woman also saw and valued Yeshua Jesus. Back in Matthew, we'll go to Matthew 16. There we go. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to go to verses 21 and 22. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Yeshua began to show his Talmudim that he must go to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. And here's Peter again, okay, the one who cuts off the ear trying to defend the Lord in the garden. Here he is, Peter. Kepha took Yeshua aside, began to rebuke him. Kind of like Jacob rebuking Joseph in that dream, but he began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You know, no way, Jose, <laughs> it, it, Peter is saying. We're not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let that happen. But Yeshua's own words, Get thee behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you're set, not setting your mind on God's interests, but man. Kepha, you've got your mind on what you want. God's will is for me to die, to be buried, to raise from the dead. But Kepha's not fully understanding that, and he's saying, I'm not going to sit by and watch you get killed. No. You know, we'll take them out. We're going to defend you. We're going to protect you. And uh, in Yeshua's weakness, he could want that. He could want his men to come to his rescue and not go through the physical suffering. But that was not the intent. It was not what was happening. So even though one was willing to try to spare him, it was not God's plan. And the same with Joseph. Even though Reuben is going to, is wants to spare his brother Joseph, it wasn't God's plan. But one did come to, to both defense. One came to the defense of Joseph, one came to the defense of Yeshua. But, um, but it didn't stop the plan. It wasn't God's plan to have it not happen. It was to happen. Not for Joseph to be killed. We're going to see that. But yes, it was for Yeshua to give his life for us. Now, again, Reuben, probably being the oldest son, had a close relationship with Father Jacob. He might have also felt responsibility as an older brother. For whatever reasons were not given, but Reuben had the right intent in his heart, let's not kill him. But he doesn't have everything. It's not total rescue. We're going to see that as we go on. So we will go back to Genesis 37, and we'll go back to verse 23. And keep reading what happens. Okay, so Reuben had said to them, don't shed blood, throw him into the pit, don't lay hands on him. He thought he could go rescue him later. So verse 23, it came about when Yosef reached his brothers that they stripped Yosef of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. Um, maybe I better just stop before I go too far. I'll take it slower. Let's you know, when they reached him, when you might have when he was come, when Joseph got there. You know, they saw him coming, they made the plot, then he's there. Once he was there, in, within their reach, they took that special coat that he had, that special tunic. Remember, it was multicolored from some of the translations, but it was the long coat reaching to the feet. It had the long arms, sleeves, you know, so it was showing one of royalty, one of exaltation rather than a worker in the field because a worker is not going to have long sleeves to get in the way and, and long sleeves uh, and long dress. He's going to have something that enables him to really bend in the field and work in the field and do the work that he was to do. So that coat, which triggered hatred in the brothers, we know that, spoke again of the royalty of the exaltation. And here's what we see with Yeshua also in chapter 19 of John. We're going back there again. Okay, whoop. Okay. Sorry, folks. John 19. And we're going to look at verse 23. Yochanan 19 and verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Yeshua, took his outer garment, garments, made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. If I'd known we were going to get to this verse, I would have waited to describe it to you at this point, but I did at the beginning, so just, you know, in summary again, it was the one piece that was all woven, didn't have seams, the other pieces, uh, a sash, and so forth, that could be divvied out. But this had to be kept as a whole, and it is going to fulfill a prophecy that they gamble for it. But uh, it was, um, again, remember they were exalting him, putting on a fake robe like he was a king. 
because the robe spoke of that royalty and that um, authority. Matthew 27 also, 27, I think we read it earlier, but we'll look at it again. Matthew 27 and verse 27. I didn't get the imp in there. Okay. Got to make correction so that the tablet can read what book to go to. There we go, Matthew 27 and verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Yeshua Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole Roman uh, cohort against him, stripped him, and put a scarlet robe on him. Mine says scarlet. You could have purple. You could have red. And it might be like Roger said that they took one of those from the Roman soldiers and uh, threw it on him like it was a regal robe and like he was king. So they're going to strip him of his coat. They're going to strip him of what looks royal because they're going to take that off of him when they go to crucify him. Okay, and they threw him back in 37. They stripped him and ch chapter 37 of Genesis verse 24. Um, oh, I read that all. Okay, then verse 24, yes, they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. We already described it could have been like a broken cistern, wouldn't hold water. Um, they, they thought probably when they were throwing him into that pit, even though Reuben was saying don't kill him, well, he'll die in that pit anyway. Um, here's my other description. I knew I had one. The cisterns were usually built narrow at the mouth and widening as they descended. So at the bottom, sometimes it was as much as 10 feet wide at the bottom, but it's going down like this. And it's not something they could easily climb out of. It was usually plastered, and it was used to serve as hiding places or even as prisons when it was dry. Like when they wanted to throw Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, because he was prophesying against them, he was preaching to them, you know, woe are you. They didn't like him correcting them, so they threw him in the pit. It was a place to keep him confined. It was a dungeon. It was uh, a holding tank, whatever words you want to use. Let me give you an example in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 6. Jeremiah 38 and verse 6, where we read, Then they took your man cast him into the cistern of Machiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse. They let Yermia down with ropes. Now in the cistern was no water, but only mud, and Yermia sank into the mud. So it was deep enough that they had him hold on to a rope. They lowered him down like you'd see a well where they had the, the um, bucket, and it'd be on a rope, and they would drop it down, get filled with water, and bring it up. Well, they still had the rope, they, instead of the bucket, they put Jeremiah there, lowered him into the, the cistern, which had no water. It was just yucky mud at the bottom. He sank into that when they made him let go of the rope. They pull the rope out. He has no way of getting out. So he's in a pit, and, and he's confined there, and that's what they wanted. Yeshahu, Isaiah 24. Isaiah chapter 24. And verse 22, and we read here, they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon. They'll be confined in prison. After many days, they will be punished. So this reading, even though it's talking about what's, hap what's going to happen later in tribulation times, it's using that same analogy. This is how they use the pit, that, that it would hold them. It would be like a prisoner in a dungeon. They'd be confined in that prison and after many days, it could be brought out and tried or whatever would happen. So how is this a comparison of Yeshua? It's our number 27. Yeshua went into Sheol, into the heart of the earth, a place that, that there, we know that there was a suffering site. And we know that on the suffering site, there was no water. Let me take you to that. Um, it was given to them in a story, not a parable, but in a story in Luke 16. This is the rich man and the beggar that had both died and gone into the heart of the earth. Remember, that's where they went when they left their, their body, their soul left their body prior to the death, burial, resurrection of Yeshua, prior to him putting his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, prior to him opening up heaven so that the believer could go into the presence of God in heaven where we go forever when we die now, when we leave this body now. 
but at this time they would go into the heart of the earth. There were like two compartments, one suffering and one paradise. And in um, Luke chapter 16 and verse 24, we read there that he cried out, the, the rich man who didn't have, he had everything and, and did nothing to help, didn't show he had a heart for God or anything. He died without God. Let me just put it that way. So he's in the suffering side. He cries out and he says, Father Abraham, because they called it Abraham's bosom. It was um, Abraham was one of the first who would have been in Sheol as far as by the time you're to this story with the rich man Lazarus, you're at... Um, Yeshua's time, you're at the first century AD, you've got 4,000 years of history with, with mankind, so many have passed away, but Abraham being one of the earliest and being the father of the, the Jewish nation, they used that as uh, a catch-all name, it was Abraham's bosom, it's Sheol, you know, however you, you phrase it. So it's like Abraham was the head of it, he wasn't really the head of it, but but he'd been there, he was recognized and had authority in his um, position and how they saw him. So this rich man says to him, have mercy on me, send Lazarus. Lazarus was the beggar. He had died, but he had died in faith, believing in the coming of Yeshua to save him. So he's in the paradise side. Send him that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. That's how we get the idea that, that hell is like flame of fire, and the, where there's a thirst, there's no water to quench the thirst, it's a place of great suffering. Lazarus in Abraham's bosom was in paradise. It was wonderful. And so the rich man, seeing him comfortable, says, send him over. There's a big gulf in between. Send him over and let him just put water on the tip of my tongue, even though I just have that little measure of comfort. Abraham's answer to him is, no one can cross that great gulf. No one can go from one side to the other. Where you are is where you stay. So um, Yeshua going into the heart of the earth is like going into a pit. But we know he didn't go into a broken cistern. He went into the paradise side. That's why he even said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, look with me on the way back to um, Genesis at Matthew 12 and verse 40, because this also was a picture, prophetically speaking, of our Messiah, of our Savior. Matthew 12 and verse 40, where we read here, for just as Yonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So throwing Yosef into a pit in the heart of the earth is a picture of Yeshua going into the pit, but into the paradise side for him, uh, Sheol. So it's, the, it's a comparison again. They both went into a holding tank. But we know for Yeshua, it was a far better experience than for Yosef. So, where are we? i got to find a place to wind up. I can't believe how fast this class goes. Um, do I tease you and tell you you don't listen fast enough? Or do I not talk fast enough? Or how do I blame it? But here we are. Um, let me just go through the couple of verses that are left. I think I can do it rapidly. Uh, and then we'll pick that up in a review next week for any who have to leave on time or early. Um, yeah, we'll, just a couple more verses. I think I can get to a stopping point. So, they've thrown him into the pit. The pit was empty. It had no water in it. Verse 24, 25, they sat down to eat a meal. Can you imagine? Here they've just thrown their brother into the pit with the intent of his death. And they're so disturbed by it, they're so guilt-ridden that they're having second thoughts. No, that's not what we read. We read that they sat down to have a meal. They've cast them into the pit, and they're just going to go ahead with life as usual. We're hungry, let's eat. And in Yeshua's day, the Jewish people were preparing for the Sabbath when Yeshua was, in essence, thrown into the pit. When he was put on trial... And it's just before the celebration of Pesach, of Passover, they're going to have the Passover supper, and they're going to have the Sabbath meal also. So they're just going to carry on, and it's even a picture today of our Jewish nation as a whole, carrying on and just doing life as business, not realizing that they have cut off their Messiah. Actually, they cut themselves off from him. 
Um, so it, it's a picture of that. Also, let me show you Mark uh, 15. Mark 15. And we read there in verse 42. Mark 15, 42. Uh, when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that's the day before the Shabbat, Yosef of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council himself, was waiting for the kingdom of God. He gathered up courage, went to Pilate, and asked for the body of Yeshua. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And he ascertained from this centurion, he granted the body to Yosef. So uh, the, the death is going to take place. For Yosef, it's not. We're going to see that he's going to come out of that pit. But the picture was the same. He was set, put into the pit with the intent to be brought to his death. And they're going on with life as usual. They're going on with preparing for the Passover and preparing for Sabbath, for Shabbat. So they're just going on. They're, they're um, calloused to what they have done. They sit down to eat the meal in Genesis 37. And they raised their eyes and looked. Behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. I'm going to hurry through this. I'll repeat this slower next week. The caravan or the company, if you've got that word, it meant a caravan. The Ishmaelites came from Avraham's line by Hagar, out of Hagar, out of Esau um, comes the Ishmaelites. And coming from Gilead, they probably originated in the Mesopotamia area. So it was probably a normal caravan route that went from Mesopotamia, went through Israel. Gilead was a plateau region. It was thickly wooded. It was east of the Jordan, and it was extending down uh, from about the Sea Galilee down toward the Dead Sea. So, you know, in that area near where, what we call Samaria, where uh, this is taking place, uh, it would be very forested, it would be very um, lush. And it was known for balms and spices. In fact, you hear the expression, the balm of Gilead, that's used for medical purposes. That came from this area. It was an aromatic resin, and it was later exported to Tyre in Syria area and elsewhere. We'll look up those verses next week that, that speak to it, because you have to see it from the original um, uh, languages to get the word balsam or bomb, but I think you get balsam in the King James Version. Anyway, um, is it Hezekiel 27, um, verses 2 and 17, that you can see that it's talking about this bomb. Again, we'll, I know I'm hurrying. We'll look that up next week and talk a little more about it, but I just want to get you what happens in the story. So they they see this caravan coming. That's, remember, they, would, they were traders, so they were bringing the spices, they were bringing the aromatic gum, the balm, the myrrh, they'd bring them down all the way to Egypt. So they come from Mesopotamia, east and north, they'd go through Israel, they'd go down to Egypt, they'd exchange and get things that Egypt, you know, could grow and what was Egypt was known for, they'd carry those back to Mesopotamia. That's the way trade took place in those days. So that caravan is on its way down to Egypt, is my point. Verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, hey, he gets this idea. What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and lay not our hands on him, for he's our brother. He's our own flesh. You know, let, let's not kill him. He's our brother. But hey, what good is it anyway? Let's not kill him because that doesn't do us any good, but we can sell him off. Now we've got money for him. We can divide the, the spoil. So that sounded like a great idea. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. We won't be the ones that have killed him. Because he's our brother. When all the other brothers listened to him, they went along with it. Hey, good idea. Yeah, let's get something for what we're doing. Let's get something out of him. So in verse 28, then some Midianite traders passed by. Now some say, okay, wait a minute, we're talking about Ishmaelites. Well, the Ishmaelites and the Midianites often were together in Scripture. They were related, they were like cousins, and they often are working together. They traded back and forth and so forth. Again, next week we'll look at that just a little bit more um, in, in our picture, but that's not a contradiction. Um, sometimes they were just called all called Ishmaelites. Sometimes the subname Midianite was used, but um, 
but they're, they're very well related through Abraham's wife Keturah also. That's Genesis 25, and I'll show you, you know, that line. But I just don't want to get sidetracked by it at the moment because I'm trying to finish to get you to a point where they stopped. So, then some Midianite traders passed by. So as this caravan's going to go on, made up of probably Midianites and Ishmaelites, they pulled him up, they lifted Joseph out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus, they brought Yosef into Egypt. So the brothers get credit for bringing Joseph down to Egypt, but they didn't do it. The Midianites are the ones that did it. When they pulled him up out of the pit, this is not a picture of resurrection because he's pulled up to be sold off, to, you know, to, to, in essence, be put to death because he'll lose his life in Egypt as far as they're concerned. And it would be a picture more of Yeshua being turned over to the others for crucifixion out to the hands of the Gentiles. Because remember, the Jewish people, all they could do is stone to death, and they didn't have the right to do it. Only Rome could execute someone at this time in the land. So Judas does the same thing. I'm going to show you an interesting name play, play on his name. You have to come back next week to get that. I want to make you want to come back and get the rest of the story. <laughs> but uh, Judas in essence sold him off into what's going to happen to Yeshua. The brothers are selling him off into what happens to, um, to Joseph. So there's our next ways that, that it is a type of deliverance. And Judas did the same to, to Yeshua as is being done to Joseph. So but we'll cover those again next week how um, it relates to Yeshua Jesus because it's a type of deliverance. It's a type of doing the same thing to Yeshua and being put into the hands of the Gentiles. My point in that is we're going to see Jew and Gentile responsible for the death of Yeshua. Really, humankind is. And it's our sins that put him to death, but he willingly gave his life. So it's not that anyone should be blamed for it and held responsible as you hear them say, well, the Jews, you know, they should suffer today because of what their ancestors did. Really? Well, your ancestors were just as guilty. Their hands were in it, too. But uh, we'll see next week um, that this caravan, they, they brought Yosef up, and he goes down into Egypt. Oh, no. What's going to happen to Yosef? He's our key player. He's the one that the line of Messiah goes through. He's been sold off as a slave into a foreign land, likelihood is he won't last long. Slaves didn't last long. The way that they were treated, they very often ended in a death, a torturous death, but they ended in death. So what's going to happen? They Are we losing? Off. They sold him off. They sold him off. Are we losing our key character? Is God pacing on the throne saying, oh no, what am I going to do about my son? Did he have any concern about Joseph? Why did he allow this to happen? What's going to happen down in Egypt? And what's all the significance of what he was sold for? Because that also is going to relate to what happened with Yeshua in a very interesting way. So next week we'll pick it back up in that. There's no way I could do it justice to give it all. But at least I could get you to the point he's out of the pit. He's headed down to Egypt. But we forgot somebody else in our story too. Remember, there was one who didn't want him put to death. One who said, throw him in the pit, and he thought, I'll get him out later and take him back to his father. Well, where is he in this picture? What's going on? Do we know? Do you know what Reuben's part in this was? Was he part of it or surprised by it? Inquiring minds want to know. If you don't want to wait a week, Read the scripture. If you want to wait a week, I'll tell you next week. <laughs> but it's right there in living color in chapter 37. We're, we're making progress. We'll get through 37 into 38, but 37 I knew would take us time because there's so much in it. I hope you're finding it rich and interesting to see the comparisons. Um, we're up now to about, we'll pick up with comparison number 28 but we've got to get all the way to 37. So we've got a few more comparisons to go. It's an interesting lesson next week. So come back, stay with me, get the rest of the story, okay? Any comments, questions?
let me just say as you're thinking it in encouragement to you, you may be at a time in your life where you feel sold off into slavery, where you feel like everything's upside down, you feel like you're out in the wilderness or in the desert, you think, I give up, this is all evil, how could any of this be any good? And maybe even if you've done it to yourself or someone's done it to you, it doesn't matter, you're having to live in these circumstances. And I would say to you, really? Do you think God's dead? Do you think that he's lost control of your life? Are you not his child? Can he not take your circumstances and work them for good? Are we going to see that with Yosef? Is he going to be a, an amazing picture of encouragement for us? Where it, and, and I'm going to spoil the story, so if you don't want to hear, close your ears. But Yosef's going to tell his brothers later, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So, if you feel you're in the midst of something evil, realize God can be meaning that for good. God brings good out of evil. God changes things around. God redeems. God gives abundant life. It may not be our way, our timing, our thoughts, but lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. So let that be your encouragement today out of this lesson. Wow, you got to think, what's Joseph thinking? And we'll hear how he feels as he's getting sold off into slavery. But God meant it for good. God was working a greater picture. So don't be discouraged. Look up and be encouraged. God has your best at heart too. When you're his child, he is there for you. Even in the fiercest, the darkest storm of your life, he is there with you. And he will bring out that rainbow out of that storm that reminds you of all his promises, all his love. Wrap yourself up in the rainbow of love. Don't stop short. Keep your eyes on him. Trust him, and you will see him bring the path that is for your best good. Amazing God and amazing grace. And the same back in Yosef's day, the same is true today. I can promise you. That's our God, and he is faithful. That's why I can promise you. It's not us. It's not we ourselves. It's our God who takes care of us. So... Any comments, questions, or shall I close in prayer? Maybe let me close in prayer and then we'll do that so those who need to go can. Lord God, thank you. You are amazing and awesome and always in control. You are working out your perfect plan for each one of us in this whole world at the same time. And even in that, we bow down in humble adoration at one who can work in, in the minutest details in all of these ways. Lord, we want to glorify you, we want to praise you, we want to thank you, and we want to trust you. Even when we're in the pit, even when it's darkest, Lord, let us trust that the pit will take us to the palace. It will take us into the perfect plan that you've had for us, that you've been working out all along. So may we look to see your rainbow promise, trust in your faithfulness, be encouraged, and in the midst of it, not complain and gripe, but see how we can serve you there until you bring us into the better place. Thank you, Lord, though, that we know the future is glorious. In Jesus' name we pray, and thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Open up your mics.